Good morning, everybody. It's uh, nine o'clock here in San Diego, so we're going to start the webinar. Today's webinar is on pr the subject of protein structure modeling and protein structure analysis. My name is Andrew Ori, and if you have any questions after the webinar, please feel free to email me or call. Uh, during the webinar, please use the text uh, messaging panel to ask any questions. And uh, if at the end you have a more complex question, I can open your mic and you can ask uh, across the, the internet. Uh, you can also follow ICM Molesoft on Twitter and the, follow and the other uh, social media sites. And there's tutorials on YouTube. A 14-day ICM Pro license is available for all webinar participants. And I will be sending out instructions after the webinar, along with the recording of the webinar. So today, key topics include uh, structure analysis tools, which uh, involve like measuring distances, uh, angles, uh, building fully interactive uh, Ramachandran plots, calculating RMSD, uh, looking at con protein uh, ligand contacts and surface areas, and also binding pocket prediction. We'll also be covering uh, some crystallographic analysis tools, uh, including building a crystallographic neighbor and contouring electron density. And then we'll be moving on to building building models. So we'll build a model model of a GP G protein coupled receptor. I'll show you how to refine it and also analyze it for health or how reasonable your model is. And then uh, once you've built your model, we have a number of tools for modeling the loop regions in, in your model. I'll also be showing rough, um, how you can also graft loops from one protein structure to another and also uh, design loops as well. And then we'll finish uh, by looking at methods for predicting the effect of mutation on protein-protein binding, peptide protein binding, and ligand protein binding, as well as uh, uh, the effect of mutation on stability. So uh, the methods in ICM, uh, the reason why it's called ICM is because we use internal coordinate mechanics. So one major problem in any modeling software is the size of the modeling system that you have. It may include many thousands of atoms. So internal coordinates tries to get around that by substantially reducing the number of variables which define each atom. So most, a lot of software use uh, traditional Cartesian description, which requires three variables per atom, x, y, and z. But in ICM, internal coordinates, we use uh, bond lengths, uh, planar angles and torsion angles as well. But we assume that bond lengths and torsion and planar angles are, are generally rigid in normal conditions. So therefore, when we're modeling, we only allow torsion angle changes. So this speeds up the, the modeling and makes it more efficient. So it obviously has applications in protein modeling, folding, and we also use the method for docking and virtual screening, which we'll be talking about uh, later in the webinar in a few weeks' time. Uh, the method is described back back in 1990, 1994 by Ruben Abagayan, who's Molsoft founder, and Max Totroff, who is our principal scientist here at Molsoft. So our first example is uh, looking at structure analysis and prediction. We're going to read in a, a, a kinase and look at the uh, RMSD difference between the APO and HOLO form. We're going to look at contact areas. Uh, some distances and angles. Uh, we can generate a Ramachandran plot, but I might wait to do that until we build a model. Uh, we'll look at protein superposition and also ICM Pocket Finder, which is shown here. So ICM Pocket Finder, basically, you take the protein, you r roll a probe across the surface, and you contour any cavities that you find. You find a number of different cavities, and then we have a way of uh, eliminating some that aren't drug-like based on size, and the, the main uh, papers for this are, are, are here. Um, Merck uh, a few years ago used ICM Pocket Finder and developed a method called drug-like density, which is a method for using them for quantifying whether a pocket is um, bindable. So. 
So the first example, we are going to use uh, three BHH. So the the search go to the search tab here and type three BHH. This is a, a CAMK kinase and we loaded it from the protein data bank. We can see that we have four molecules, A, B, C, and D. And this is an interesting structure because uh, molecule A and molecule B both have a ligand and C and D are in the APO form. So what we're going to do is just compare the APO and HOLO form of this kinase. So to do that, um, just for clarity, I'm going to delete some molecules. I'm going to delete the B and keep the C molecules. And so you can see which molecule is which. I'm going to go to display tab and color by on the ribbon. It's displayed in ribbon. So anything we do here, we can go color by. And we can say uh, by molecule. So now we have two, we have the two molecules. One in the APO form, we can see the ligand. The one in HOLO form, we have the ligand here. And the APO form in yellow. So it'd be nice to see what effect that the, the ligand bound to this kinase has on the structure. So let's just move out the, I'm just going to delete these, these are water molecules, we don't uh, need them for this example, so I'm just going to delete those as well. So to compare, we need to, at the moment they're in one object, so to compare them we need to separate them out, and so we have two separate. So we can move this object out of this PDB structure by right clicking and say move, uh, move from object. And just for clarity, I'm going to rename this um, PDB file. So right click on it and rename, and we'll call it the APO form. And the same with this one, just for clarity, I'm going to rename HOLO. OK, so at the moment, uh, they're in their crystallographic um, positions in, in, the, in the crystal structure. So we're going to superimpose them. Uh, we've shown this a couple of times in, in the past webinars. So there's. Uh, in the tools panel, there are some uh, more complex way of superimposing, but the easiest way to superimpose is to uh, select. It's going to select the uh, one molecule and use the control key and select the other one. So uh, just double click, just double click to select. You can see that blue means it's selected, and then we have this convenient superimpose button here, and that will superimpose the APO form on the HOLO form like that. So you can see the superimpose. As, as I've shown before, it's a very useful tool, the superimpose button, because you can basically um, select what you want to superimpose. So if you want to superimpose the N terminal, which might be a good idea because we're comparing the, or we could we could select the binding pocket, for example, we can just click there. Ask us a static object, the holo doesn't really matter. And that re readjusts the alignment. So now the N terminal is superimposed and the C terminal so we could play around with different ways of doing that. So our first task is to see what the RMSD difference is between these two, the RMSD between these two structures. So as before, we can double click on the APO to, to select it. And for this procedure, we need to have two selections. So the convenient way to do that is to convert this green selection to an orange selection. So it's selected here, and then just double click on the other one. So now we have two. We have a green. We're comparing green with orange. And then we go to Tools, Analysis, RMSD, and then we have some options. So you can either you can calculate RMSD for um, amino acid proteins, which we're going to do, or chemicals, which is a slightly different procedure. Um, we can choose to keep it in place or superimpose, but we've already superimposed to a reasonable uh, level. Uh, we can superimpose by aligned residues or exact match, but we're okay with how it is at the moment. Or we can superimpose, we can calculate the RMSD for everything that's selected. So if we selected all side chains and all side chain atoms, or you can um, RMSD for the C alpha backbone or heavy atoms or any other selection based on what you've selected. So we're going to do what we have selected. So just go apply, and that reports the RMSD value here. 1.9 angstroms. Okay, so 
our next task is to, it'd be nice to compare the binding pocket of the APO and HOLO form. So to do that, uh, we need to, um, at the moment it's an x-ray structure, so there's no hydrogens or anything like that. So uh, we need to convert what we call convert x-ray structure into an ICM object. And this will add hi um, hydrogens, it will optimize certain residues such as glutamines and asparagines uh, if you choose to, or and histidines if you choose to. But if you, um, we'll show how to do that. So we right click here and we say convert PDB. So you see that the right click menu basically responds to whatever you want to do to, uh, you want to do it on. So if I was just wanted to convert the, the chemical, I'd right click on the chemical, but I want to convert the whole structure to an ICM object. So I right click here, say convert PDB. Um, just for, if you're doing this in a real experiment, you would optimize the hydrogens. If you haven't already we've got hydrogens added maybe from a different program, then you wouldn't need that, but uh, generally the case is you, you do. Um, we're not going to optimize asparagines and glutamines and histidines, but um, you might want to do that in reality. Um, we're going to replace the original. Uh, there's also an option called hide missing side chain. So if there's certain atoms missing in the X-ray structure, ICM will not build them. But if you uncheck this, ICM will do its best to build that full residue and, and uh, create that residue. And we just go OK. So this is converting it. So now we see that the XR has turned into ICM. So now this is an ICM object. I'm just going to do the other thing, the other uh, process for the, um, the APO form as well. So convert, go OK. Now the, the structures are ready for analysis um, using ICM Pocket Finder. So as before, we select what we want to analyze. We're going to first build the pocket for the holo form. So go to Tools, 3D Predict, ICM Pocket Finder. And the selection is one molecule, one molecule. Uh, the tolerance level is a, a, a way of, if you, check, if you make it higher, you're going to find smaller pockets or more exposed pockets on the surface. But this is pretty well trained for small molecule drug-like pockets. Um, if you want to not find pockets where there's already ligands, you could say keep compounds, but um, in this example, just go OK. So this builds a, a table at the bottom. So for, for this structure, we found uh, four different pockets, one, two, three, and four. So we can display those pockets by checking in here. So the first one it found is actually the ATP binding, po binding site with the hinge, uh, with the uh, glycine rich loop here and there's some allosteric ones in the C terminal here three of them down here it reports um, some useful information about the volume and area and how hydrophobic the pocket is uh, it has the how buried um, so so these are pretty drug-like um, um, pockets and we also plot volume against area and if it falls in the shaded region, then it's a kind of a, a reasonable uh, size for, for a, a small molecule drug. There's also this D-LID score, which was developed by Merck, so you can also um, look at that. So uh, the, the lower that score is, the, the more likely, according to their metri metri um, calculations, using all this information, um, how likely it's going to be a, a drug-like pocket. So um, we have four pockets for the holo form. And if we do the same for the APO form, we can do it to tools, 3D predict, and then, um, sorry, 3D predict, ICM pocket finder, and we run it again. And we see in the APO form, we have a few more, a few more pockets. I'm just going to undisplay the holo form pockets, and then we can display, so there's a Quite a big, large one here, sort of connecting two pocket regions, um, and the one here in the C terminal here. Yeah. And this is the—it's obviously smaller because uh, it's in the in the APO form. This is the APO pocket, so we can compare it with the pocket with the ligand with the holoform. You can see that uh, the pockets are. Uh, Significantly, in the holo form, the pocket is certainly uh, bigger. These dashed lines means that this um, 
glycine rich loop is missing one, two, three, four residues and this one is missing one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we'd built a model, we could maybe, you may see a slightly different pocket uh, formation, but in this example, uh, we, this is what we have so, so far. Um, so you can change the way they're represented by wire, for example, or um, smooth, if you right click in the, in the box here, smooth transparent, and the same with this one. So um, I have some questions, but I think I'm going to have to maybe answer them at the end, or I'll try to get to them as, as before, uh, if I can. So um, you can keep asking the questions, and then I'll get to them at the end. So the, the, two, the two pockets are, are shown. So it would also be nice to see what contacts there are between the, uh, the, the ligand in, this, in the holo form and the, and the protein. So one way to do that we can see what, what, which residues make the strongest contacts between this ligand and this. You could also do it between two proteins, but we're just doing it between a ligand. So we select the ligand, we go to Tools, and we say 3D Predict, so Analysis, and then there's an option called Contact Areas. Click OK. So it's asking you for a selection and then it has this um, X-stick zoom scale. So this means uh, it will try and uh, scale the size of the sticks uh, of the residues according to how much uh, contact it has with the ligand. So the thicker the stick, the more likely um, the, uh, the, higher the, the, more, the higher the interaction between the two. So we go OK. And I'm just going to zoom in here. So we can quite clearly see that the, the leucine here, leucine 143, is making the strongest contact. It's, just, it's the thickest stick. We also get a table here with the contact um, area um, and exposed area and a, and a percentage buried, so uh, the percent um, of the residue that is buried according to this contact. So leucine 143 makes the, close, uh, the, the highest contact area. There's also closest distance. The first, the first one is actually the ligand, so you can ignore that. Um, but um, if we if we sort it, we can find that. Um, so if you click on the on the on the table, it should take you to that residue. Let me just see why. Okay, so it's saying that um, in terms of distance, uh, valine 93, which is here it's the closest, but the, the contact is not that strong. It's the closest; it's on the hinge region. So, other uh, analysis we could look at is the hydrogen bonds. So, we just click on the display tab. Uh, we've, we've converted it to an isomorphic object, so it's got hydrogens, and then we just click here, and we can see the hydrogen bond here. If you click and hold on the hydrogen bond button, you can change the the, the way it's displayed. So it's dotted lines or um, you have the distance and you can show spheres and just toggle it on and off. So the green colouring means it's a strong hydrogen bond in terms of um, uh, in terms of the um, the angle and distance. So it's a, a strong if, it, if it's if it's a weak hydrogen bond it'd be blue. Um, and all the hydrogen bond pairs are dumped into the ICM workspace here, so you can check them, display them, toggle them on and off. I think this is the one, this is our one here. So you can change the... Okay. You can also um, measure a distance as well, because we've got this uh, valine 93 into this atom here. So you can measure a distance by clicking here, and clicking on one atom, clicking on the other, and that displays the distance, 2.6. You can change that font, um, make it larger, whatever, um, here. And it's just, I think we showed this the other day with the, with the angles as well. So you just select, for an angle, you just select three, three atoms, and it displays the angle here. 
um, and um, with the torsion angle, we we'll select four um, four atoms. Oh, so you need to check the torsion atom torsion angle atom uh, button here. So uh, one, two, three, and four, and then it's displayed around here. It's hard to see it, but. Um, Okay, so that's uh, the structure analysis. So uh, next, uh, the, the next uh, set of slides are about crystallographic symmetry, or the crystallographic tools that are embedded into ICM. So if we read in, for example, one CDG from the PDB, we'll see that when we read it in, we just have one molecule, and we have these uh, sugar molecules just sticking out into space. And we might wonder why, how, the, how does it bind here? And the reason, obviously, is because there's a symmetry-related subunit that actually interacts with that um, structure. So you need to calculate that symmetry-related subunit. So to do that, um, just, uh, start afresh. So we read in that 1CDG. Okay, we can see the sugar molecule here. It's going to un I've got the high quality graphics on. So we can see that, I just select that maltose. So it's not clear how or why that's binding like that. So to generate the crystallographic neighbors to this um, molecule, we go to tools. And we choose X-ray. And this is a, this has all the crystallographic uh, tools in here. So you can also display crystallographic cells. You can also bit display the whole biomolecule. For, because for example, for a for a virus, you might want to do that. And crystallographic neighbor, we can say that we want to build the neighbors within 15 angstroms of our selection. And we go OK. And you see that the the neighbor is here. We get an extra object, and we can display it in ribbon. It's got the waters displayed for some reason. Okay. The other thing, when you're analyzing the structure, you may want to be aware of uh, things like occupancy, B factors, and alternative residues. So B factor is a, a temperature uh, factor. A normal range is ideally is between 5 and 50 angstroms squared. Um, the occupancy is a fraction of the atomic density at a given point. So if there are two equally occupied conformers, both will have occupancy of 0 0.5. Um, if, it's, if it's completely a, a value of 1 would mean that it's there. A 0 will see, be missing. And some high-resolution structures have a, um, alternative conformations, which, which are useful for, if it, for example, it's in your binding pocket. Um, it's, you have multiple confirmations in the pocket, which is helpful for, for drug design and things like that. So uh, I'm just going to read an example for that. An example is one PDB search, one HMT, which is a fatty acid uh, binding protein. It's bound with uh, stearic acid here. And if we look at residues, uh, valine, 32, I can expand here to select the valine 32, and threonine 36, we display those, we selected them, so we go to display tab, and then anything in the display tab will respond to your selection. And you can see for these two, we have alternative confirmations for each of the residues, the threonine and the valine. This is a, it's a pretty high resolution structure, 1.4 angstroms. Okay, and just have a final finish. So, for example, you may want to. Um, so, in the crystal, the crystallographic the crystallographer will probably see something like this when he's solving the, uh, for example, for histidines. And, and so, you need to be uh, aware of best orientation for the histidines. So, uh, we need to discriminate between these two uh, conformations. 
So often the chi angle needs to be corrected by 180 degrees. And ICM, when you convert from an X-ray structure to an ICM structure, ICM object, um, it will convert those. Or it will it will do the best, find the best hydrogen bonding. Uh, it will maximize hydrogen bonds and other interactions. But if you've already modeled it in another software, um, you can choose to just keep as it is and not play around with your histidines. And it's the same with um, asparagines and glutamines. So um, the or orientation at the heavy atom level is, is, is similar in, in the electron density, so we need to be able to discriminate uh, between the two. Okay. And while we're on the subject of uh, electron density, I'm just going to show how we can display the electron density of a of a structure. So for this example, I'm going to go to search and to 1xbb. Oh, type in 1xbb. So the this is another kinase. And to get the electron density, we can go file open if we have our own electron density, or we can go to load and we can download the electron density map from the um, Uppsala uh, electron density uh, database. OK, so this loads the map. So we can see the electron density map here. And we might want to look at the electron density around the ligand. So uh, we could right click on the ligand, for example, and say uh, neighbors. And we choose distance for radius, maybe uh, within seven angstroms. And then we have an option for type, so uh, the selection is around the same object. I'm only interested in the residues in this object, but you could say all objects or all visible objects. Um, we don't want to select the ligand. We, you know, we could, yeah, we'll, we'll do the electron density for the ligand as well, so we will keep the ligand. So the source is, is the where we're selecting from. So. Um, and we go OK. And this, you can see, has made an atom selection. And so it's only going to fight, it's only going to hit atoms within seven angstroms of the ligand. So in order to display the full side chain for each of the hits we have, we need to expand this selection a little bit to encompass all the atoms in the residues that, that are seven angstroms from the thing. So there's a button called R here. And this propagates the selection to all atoms. So you can see. We have more uh, green crosses, and uh, then we can display the uh, in 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 the wire, and then we go to tools, X-ray, and there's an option called contour electron density map. So uh, we, the map is one x m one x b b here. Uh, we can contour at different sigma levels, or we can change it on the fly um, once we've made them. But um, we're going to do it at two different uh, sigma levels, uh, and we just go OK. And this uh, should contour that region. So we can see the, if we just undisplay the 2.5 sigma level, we can just see the, the um, I don't think there's any density here because the selection didn't go far enough out so to, to make that uh, selection. So um, it's pretty decent. Everything's you can you can go in and have a look at each one. So we can also color by uh, B factor, for example, the ribbon. You say color by B factor. So there's um, you can see we can display the the electron density maps. And you can see that the, the, the glycine-rich loop here has a pretty high B factor. We can look at the scale of that by going to the labels tab, and you get a little bar here. So zero, zero um, B factor is blue, and around the 50% level, 50 level is um, green. So you can find out more, maybe more flexible region, possibly highlighted. If we color by occupancy, um, it's going to be, in this example, it's all one because uh, we have the, the back, or the, if the backbone atoms that aren't there, so we have zero occupancy here because of the gap, but um, we see it here. But if you'd built um, some, of your some of your atoms in your residues when you converted, 
then you could say color by occupancy and it would flag those that were zero and it would flag the ones that ICM built. Right, okay. Um, so that's the uh, crystallographic analysis tools. So now we're going to move on to homology modeling. So in homology modeling, you need to find the, you have a query sequence shown here, and then you need to go to the PDB and find a closest template structure. Then you align the sequences to the template, and you copy the aligned backbone atoms. Then you need to predict uh, side chains, the side chain conformations. And then the most challenging part is those regions where there's no, there's no good homology, for example, in the loops. And there's different methods for, for doing this. And um, we'll talk about those uh, in a bit. And then once you have your model, then you need to refine it and fix those regions that are have maybe clashes or, or poor, poor geometry. And the way we do it in ICM, we use the mo method called ICM Bias Probability Monte Carlo. Uh, that was a paper by Ruben Abagayan again and Max Totroff here, here at um, Molsoft. Okay, so last week we looked at building sequence alignments, and I mentioned we're going to build a, G a GPCR uh, model, and so that's what we're going to do now. So G-protein cover receptors all share a common structural core of seven TM helices, uh, but they lack uh, significant sequence homology between them. But fortunately for modelers of GPCRs, that there are some key motifs in the TM region. So this is helix one, helix two, helix three. For example, in Helix 3, there's the DRY motif, which is shown here. And this can help you uh, sort of uh, adjust the alignment in order to uh, build, a, build the best model. So um, because of this, uh, this poor sequence homology, for building GPCRs, it's probably best to GPCR models. It's usually best to go to the ProSite database download the class A alignment, and then you can see where your, your um, query sequence falls in the tree. And you can maybe find um, some templates that way. So I can just show you this way. So we go file, recent files. Um, so this is a subset of, uh, of the ProSite alignment. And it's um, so we can maybe view the, the tree here. So you, if you if you downloaded this from the a larger um, database, that you'd have many hundreds of sequences. And so you can view the the tree here. And so maybe you could you could play around with the distance and try and find uh, thing um, other templates that fall in, into your into your tree. Or alternatively, you can do a blast search against the PDB. So in most cases, for GPCRs, it's probably best to use a bigger family alignment, or maybe for other proteins as well. Um, but the most, more convenient way of finding an initial template would be to do a blast search. So um, to do that, we need to read in our query sequence. So the, the, the model we're going to build is of um, GPR120, which is a class A GPCR. It's, um, it's dysfunction uh, when it's dysfunctional, it's responsible for reduced uh, fat metabolism. So it's a, an, it's a target for uh, obesity uh, drugs. So we need to download the sequence. So we go to Uniprot, this is our query sequence. We go to the search tab, click Uniprot. We can type in the Uniprot code, which is F8, for this example is FFAR4 underscore human. And this uh, gives us a table with that, uh, with the information from Uniprot. So we, this is a link to the Uniprot website. So the accession code, uh, the full name, free fatty acid receptor four, and uh, there's a sequence in here as well. But to download the sequence, we just double click on the table, and this will put the sequence down here, where you can see the sequence. Okay, so 
I'm now going to try and do a blast search, see if it works. So it, is, it sometimes takes a little bit of time. So we go to Uniprot, we go to blast, um, so there's an option called NCBI blast here, and the sequence we want to blast is our query sequence, which is this um, FFAR4 underscore human. And it's at the bottom here. And then we would just, um, you can you can blast the whole Uniprot, but for modeling, obviously, we just want to find the sequences from the PDB. So we would go here. Okay, I'm not brave enough to run it. So I've got an example of this, going to delete all. And then, um, uh, lost. So if you do that, you would get a table like this with um, the descriptor description of the PDB file, the um, the PDB code here, and a score. Okay. So I know from past experience that one decent template is the adrenergic receptor it's going to be, yeah. and so that the the template we will use for this modeling example is, is shown here 3p 0g so to load that in we just go to search tab use the PDB search type 3p 0g that displays the structure it's going to delete some things so we don't need these So to build our model, so far we've got two of the three things that we need. So we need one more thing, which is the alignment. We have the query sequence, which is this one. We have the PDB structure we're going to build the model on, which is this one. Um, I'm just going to show you how to do that. So to take the sequence from the PDB structure, we, uh, you right-click on the, on, the, on the molecule. You read in the structure, right-click, and say extract sequence. And then that loads it here. So we're ready for the alignment. So we can make the alignment by selecting the two sequences that we're interested in. So you can just use control. Or if there's more than two, um, you can use tab, a uh, shift to select a range or control to use to select a non-contiguous list. And then we right click and we say align sequences. So this builds our sequence alignment here. So the alignment obviously is, is key to making a, a decent model. And so we can use the tools in the alignment panel to improve the, the alignment a bit. So we want to really shift any gaps we have towards the end, towards the loops, if possible. So uh, we can display the profile. This helps to, um, this shows where we can find, for example, the DRY motif, hopefully, somewhere in Helix 3 here and um, so we can also display the secondary structure as well so this helps with the helices so the helix one is here you can see that it's pretty um, decent alignment for helix one we've got no gaps uh, the key motif is this leucine so that's okay and same with helix two here no gaps, the aspartic acid is conserved, and in helix 3 we obviously have this TRY motif, and when this disulfide bond here you can see that it's linked um, this cysteine to this cysteine here, that's conserved, so it's pretty decent alignment. If we double click on the connection here that shows the, the disulfide bond in the structure. Um, then, um, so in Helix 4, which I think starts here, got tryptophan, tryptophan, conserved, and so there's a few problems here we need to make decisions on, for example, in Helix, in the last Helix, we can, so if we need to shift the alignment, you can use the cursor key button to shift the alignment up and down and, uh, and fix it. And so we can remove this gap here as well. In here. 
Okay, so there's a variety of things we could do, and we would need to do it very carefully, but just for time constraints, um, we're going to leave it as it is here. So, so you can only shift into a gap. So uh, we can bring this helix together. We, we don't want a gap in the middle of our helix here, so we can shift it on. Okay, so now we're ready to build the homology model. So we've got all our components, we've got the template, we've got the query sequence, we've got the alignment. So we go to the homology menu, and there's some options here for building alignments as well, but uh, that you can play around with, with those if you have time. Um, and then, in reality, you would go to the full model builder. So you have two tabs, single chain, multiple chain. So if you're building a, uh, in this example, we're building a single chain, we've only got, we're only building a molecule on the A subunit. But if you had multiple chains, for example, in an um, antibody or something like that, um, you would make maybe three, four different, depending on how many molecules you have, alignments between the query and the crystal structure, and then it will make the, that multiple chain model on the fly. But in this example, we just have two. Um, it asks us for the alignment, which is ALN, or you can make a structure-guided alignment uh, but we spent a little bit of time fixing our alignment, so we're quite happy with how it is. Um, these options allow you to add gaps, uh, allows ICM to play around with adding gaps. You can build a symmetric oligomer model, if, if that was the case, but it's not in that point. And we also, if we had a ligand that we wanted to use, we would select the ligand and um, put it to an orange selection using this. Um, but I don't want to do that in this example. And then we have some options. So quick test is usually the best approach. It's going to make a quick model, and you can just look how, because um, these other options take a long time to run. So the quick test will see how well your backbone is aligned, your, your query sequence is aligned to the backbone of the template. And then um, you would want to refine, if you're making a full model, you would do full refinement, and that will fix it. This process, even the quick test, takes a little bit longer. So I'm going to use... If you just want to make a quick and ready model, you go to homology, quick model. And it's kind of a similar uh, process. Um, and we can just, for this example, just go OK. And that builds the, the model. It takes a little bit of time. OK. While that's building, we can move on to the next subject, which is loop modeling. So throughout the years, ICM has been used in a number of successful ways for uh, protein design. And one of those examples is shown here with um, this isomerase uh, with collaboration with uh, Rick Varinga's group. And it, sh it showed that the homology modeling method accurately modeled a, an interacting loop region. And that was later confirmed using uh, crystallography. So you can compare the crystal structure with the, with the, uh, the known with the with the model and so in ICM there's two different ways to doing it you can take your loop region and you can search the PDB for for loops that are similar in distance and and uh, and size or the most full method is um, you take the ligand you take the loop and then you optimize as they're doing here you optimize that loop in the using the ICM stochastic global optimization Monte Carlo method and and I ideally model that loop you can see here this the blue one is the model and the green one is the crystal structure so it's a very decent um, prediction and the uh, latest force field and loop modeling benchmark is published in this paper by Elena and Max and Ruben from Molsoft and just as a protein modeling success story a, a very interesting review paper reviewed um, describes uh, this GPCR modeling so back in 2009 there was the only structures of the uh, antagonist uh, GPCRs, but um, using ICM, uh, Seva Katrich and Ruben Abagayan, uh, he's at UCSC, USC and Ruben's at uh, UCSD and uh, he's the founder of Mosul. Uh, they successfully um, predicted how the agonist structure might look. So they made this prediction and they noted that this TM5 um, would maybe extracellular part shifts inwards 
about two angstroms if you put a, if you model it with a with an agonist inside the pocket. And then one year later, the actual crystal structure was solved, and this prediction was was shown to be correct. And that's um, in the trends in pharmaceutical sciences paper. It's useful. Okay, so our model is now made, and we have this ICM object called MDL, which is our model. So we can display it. And as I mentioned, it's a pretty rough model um, because we didn't do any um, optimization of it. But if you were doing it properly, you would go to homology and you would do full model builder. Yeah. So we can look at the protein health, which is probably not a good idea because it's going to be a bit. There's going to be clashes because we've got no optimization of side chain. The side chains are just literally being placed on the backbone. So we can run protein health and go to tools analysis. Uh, sorry. Tools 3D predict protein health, and this will flag uh, regions that are sick. So um, we have quite a few of them. So it's looking at the energy of the residue and looking at the normalized, uh, idealized um, energy, and it flags the, where some residues are particularly away from normalized energy. So, um, for example, if we looked at this um, phenylalanine here, so we double click. Um, we can we can see particularly it's so a red uh, it means a very poor energy of those residues so uh, if we for example look to here we're going to see a number of clashes yeah <laughs> so these these residues need to be sorted out so uh, if you go to um, labels we can show clashes these blue and green lines indicate a clash so what the um, optimization procedure does which we didn't do um, it basically does a, a bias probability Monte Carlo optimization of these residues so we can I'll just show you that um, visually um, see if these two so if you select the residues and then right click on them and say advanced and then optimize side chains uh, this will run you can see it's doing a, a bias probability Monte Carlo simulation so it's randomly sampling the position and you see that short um, sampling flip that ring out and it's no longer clashing with this phenylalanine so if we run 3D predict protein health yeah this is better it's not so red but there's obviously another clash maybe here so the so you can also run there's a method called here refine model which also refines it okay so um, that's homology modeling and we can also analyze it so protein health we can also build a Ramachandran plot so if we go to tools and analysis um, let me just make a selection you just need to select what you want to build it so we want to build it of the model so we select the model go to tools and choose analysis and Ramachandran plot interactive this will build so we've got the sci-fi angle plot here and we have some few outliers you can select them single click here shows you where that is this phenylalanine it takes you directly to that residue in the structure as well so we well, can select a number of them by clicking and dragging over the region point. right um, so that's the the modeling and we're going to finish with just um, some I think just one example on um, prediction of the effect of mutation so if we go edit delete all so there's two there's predicting the effect of mutation on binding and also predict of the uh, predicting the effect of mutation on stability as well so for binding there's a prediction for protein 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 peptide and protein ligand affinity upon mutation and the binding free energy change is computed as a difference between the free energy of the mutant against the wild type the energy is calculated for fixed backbone and all the side chains except those in the vicinity of the mutatable residue Monte Carlo simulations are carried out to relieve poss possible atomic clashes created as a result of the mutation to larger amino acids so just an example we go to mole mechanics and um, 
we choose trimutation, and there's some more inbuilt examples. So for protein binding, okay. So here we have a um, antibody antigen complex, and the the antigen is the D subunit. I'm just going to color by by a molecule, make it a bit clearer. Okay. And in this example, um, we are going to um, <clears throat> model the, uh, we're going to see the effect of, of mutating lysine 15 in the antigen. So we can expand here, choose uh, the lysine 15, which is this one, and that selects it. So this lysine is making interactions with um, three other molecules. So we need to make sure we include those in the selection. So we go to mole mechanics, we try mutation, protein, protein binding. We're, we're only going to mutate one residue, but you can in fact select maybe 10 or so residues in the surface between the two proteins that you're interested in. And then you need to select uh, which uh, residues you want to mutate to, or you can select all. Um, unnatural amino acids, I think you can choose here as well. Yeah, so if you have any unusual amino acids, you can search through this table to find them, or you can sketch and close it. So the interacting part one is consists of the A, B, and C subunits. So we type in the interacting part one, we say A, comma, B, comma, C, and the same, and part two is the D molecule where we've got the um, where the mutation is, and we just go OK. And this is running, tells us here it's running a one background job, it's calculating the mutation. Okay, just going to go, so the other predict mutation is, um, sorry, predicting the effect of mutation upon uh, protein stability. So this method computes the change in protein stability upon mutation of a single residue. The free energy change in protein stability is computed as shown here, the free energy of the unfolded and misfolded states um, is approximated by a sum of the residue specific energies. So kind of as before, the mutation of a given residue is followed by a Monte Carlo simulation with flexible side chains for the mutated residue and its neighboring residues. And hopefully our prediction is finished. Oh, we got an error. But um, when it runs correctly, um, there was some, some, you'll get a table of, I'll show you previous, uh, you get a table of delta, delta G, so for, in this example we um, we tried it for all the amino acids, and so you, the ones that are, uh, are going to have an effect are in green with a low delta, delta G. Okay, and finally, just to finish up, um, uh, the one thing I did miss was the loop modeling. So for loop modeling, um, we need a You'd have your model, for example. Just, um, it would need to be an ICM object. And um, so to model a loop, you'd, you'd make your model as before. And then you would select loops that are, in interest, that are of interest to you. Um, usually probably maybe around the binding pockets or, or something like that. I uh, have to be careful because loop modeling is um, it's not as easy as modeling onto a conserved uh, region. So you need to be careful on the length of the loop you're going to model. But maybe up to seven or eight residues you, you'll be okay. So we can uh, select the loop once a model. We go to mole mechanics and go to loop and there's different options. So uh, go to sampling modeling and then there's, as I mentioned there's two modeling options there's one interactive which is going to go through the PDB and look for loops that have similar uh, distance and size which is the quick way but the more high precision way is to um, fully optimize this um, loop region using the bias probability Monte Carlo method and um, so that's going to do the interactive quick way you go OK and you run that method so you can see it's, it's going through sampling. 
and we found uh, 279 um, stack confirmations for this loop so you can toggle through them or play a movie of that and in this loop uh, uh, in this here you can also design a loop you can if for example you had here we could design a loop we could add these three residues here or you can in the loop menu again you could um, graft from one structure to another the loop confirmation uh, you can also ask ICM to find the preferred residues in that region for that loop if you're looking to model and also just to find the PDB segments uh, from the PDB database so you can read those directly from the PDB and, and compare your loops as well okay so just finishing uh, this is kind of old now actually it's 2012 but um, some of the um, chapters are still very uh, still very useful it covers homology modeling from uh, from looking for classification of proteins through to alignments sequence structure alignments uh, different force fields different methods for homology modeling including ligand receptor guiding modeling uh, loop simulations and then uh, some examples of modeling more challenging um, proteins such as membrane proteins That's, uh, it's in the methods in molecular biology series and finally if you have we've got some questions to answer but if you have any more just please feel free to um, to write them down or, or let me know you can I, I can open your microphone uh, any questions you can also email me afterwards I'm, there's some there's quite a few questions so I might have to get back to you one one-on-one -on -one, um, if I don't have time here um, and then coming up next in two weeks time we're looking at ICM chemistry which is a chemi chemiformatics package which is a spreadsheet so you can um, build your own databases based on uh, Marcouche or structures or by reaction that's a full chemiformatics package and then following that will be uh, ligand design using the 3D interactive ligand editor which we developed with um, with Novartis and with medicinal chemists at Novartis and so this allows you to do docking it allows you to modify the ligand on the fly and if you have a lead compound it's a way of generating new leads and then we're going to end on November 17th looking at virtual ligand screening um, using so you could take a database of a million compounds dock it to a pocket and how to how to score those and how to eliminate um, and you know, to, to get a test uh, a set for, for testing so that's what's coming up